I went to a talk one time given by Bo Lozoff. Lozoff. Um, he was a guy who would go into prisons with uh, something called the Prison Ashram Project, and he taught meditation practice to prisoners. And he said during this talk that he would often say to them, and of course to all of us, life is deep. Life is deep and you're not acting like it. Bo wasn't referring to the deep-rooted systemic injustices that got many of these men into prison in the first place. He just meant life is deep in the moment. Life is deep as it is right now, wherever you are. And we're not acting like it. And that was something I never forgot. Life is deep. Our souls know it. And our days are often too violently overscheduled to honor that fact. Our minds are too colonized and crowded to be able to really respect it. As a deer longs for the flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for the living God. So how do you interpret that? What is the living God to you? For what do you thirst? Beyond all the strivings for which you work, I believe that every single one of you knows what you thirst for deeply. I believe every single one of us has managed to connect with that thing, to feel at rest in it, to feel the awe and wonder and sense of blessedness that can only be found in relationship to that thing, what I'm calling the living waters, the source of the soulful life. Do you remember maybe a long time ago when you were a kid, and you, you'd lay on your back in the grass and you'd watch the clouds go by and maybe you had a friend with you and you would just talk about the universe, the cosmos, or maybe um, it was in college, if you went to college, those late night bowl sessions in the dorm and you would just go everywhere, life, death, all of it. Or you, in seventh grade, when you played Dungeons and Dragons with your buddies and you'd talk about all these imaginary things, and it meant so much. You were creating yourself. You were listening to your souls. Adulthood so easily convinces us, or maybe we try to convince each other, that these conversations don't matter, that these musings are a waste of time, that what really matters is getting stuff done, checking off the items on your to-do list, you get your degree, maybe. Then you're done with your deep study. You're done with deep listening, formal learning. But the most important learning is never done. That's why we call it lifespan faith development. We have to study the soul every day. We have to make time for that. Or we will get lost. And our children will get lost. And creation will get lost as it is already getting lost. You know that is happening. When we lose touch with the soul, it has terrible consequences. Generations ago, elders took their children by the hand and brought them to buildings or huts or certain places in the forest or in the woods that had stars and crosses out front or other sacred symbols and maybe incense or candles or a sacred fire and ancient languages. And they took them there to meet the ancestor spirits and to drink from the deep waters of tradition, to sit by the well of tradition and hear the old stories, sing the old songs, perform the old ritual movements, to make offerings to the gods, but as time went on, the waters of those wells were muddied by hypocrisy or abuse or by human sin of another kind. They were corrupted by colonists or invaders. The priests and priestesses and shamans, those seers, fell out of fashion, were killed, were converted, or were run out of town 
And eventually science and rationalism provided, or so many thought, or pro proved rather that the old gods weren't true, that none of that was really real. Now, all of this happened, but people have never stopped thirsting. No deep waters naturally arose to replace the old wells of the living waters that were bricked over, and so we have had to go digging for them. But it gets tiring. It gets really tiring doing all that digging. It's easy to just give up and turn on the TV or just never let your phone out of your hand or fight on Facebook for a while. It's tiring to dig for the new wells that bring forth living waters, so sometimes we just start to worship the new gods peddled by commercialism or CNN or Fox News or the New York Times. What's deep? What's deep? You know, do you ever, in the midst of watching a Patriots game and getting furious over a bad call, do you ever, it, does it ever occur to you, I'm gonna die someday. <laughs> and it's okay to do that. It's okay, that's fine, that's normal. We should be having those moments. But are we regularly going into the realms of the soul that strengthen and secure our hearts for this reality? Or are we worshiping Tom Brady or Gronk? Is that his name, Gronk? You can tell I'm not a football person. Because there are no other worthy gods to rely on in our time. The stock market, do we worship that? Or Dr. Oz, you know, the new shamans, there are so many of them. I will tell you something. The deep part of you that calls to the deep in creation is not meant to keep you safe and comfortable and not meant to give any of us answers that we expect or desire. That's why we call it the mystery. I wanna tell you two little stories about what living deeply may tell you and where it may bring you. And the first one is the story of Martha and Wait Still Sharp. Some of you may have seen the documentary about them that aired this past week on PBS. We're gonna be showing it in a, as a church program, so don't bum out if you, did, if you missed it. Um, Wait Still Sharp was a Unitarian minister and he and Martha, his wife, left their little children in, in the 1930s in Wellesley, Massachusetts, and they went to Europe to save Jews from the Nazis. They were willing to live that deeply. That's what it required of them. So after this show aired, everybody on my Facebook feed, which is full of Unitarian Universalists, was saying, oh my gosh, wow, would you go? Would you have done that? And I was thinking to myself, I don't know, you know, but let's translate that for today. The question for today is more, Vicki, would you harbor a refugee in your home? Or Vicki, would you go to a peaceful protest for Black Lives Matter movement this week? Because it, it might be dangerous. You never know who has a gun out there and who might be really angry. Police are in danger. Civilians are in danger in this, this encounter we're having. Vicki, would you go out and have coffee with someone who opposes everything you stand for? You know, because you're not going to probably be asked to go to Europe. But you're probably going to be able to go into Swampscott or Lynn or Marblehead and have coffee with someone who disagrees with you. If you think of the deepest people of the soul, as gurus on a mountaintop removed from all the chaos of society, that's actually really wrong because there's no person alive or who has ever lived deeply and soulfully who hasn't woven their lives in with the lives of others and particularly with vulnerable and rejected others. It is not possible to become a, spirit, a, a soul person and and to do that, to remove yourself. There is no guru who dwells on any mountaintop or lives in any ashram or monastery or retreat center who knows anything worth teaching, who has not first become deeply acquainted with the realities of evil and suffering. 
and who hasn't lived through chaos and worked hard to find the truths that go deeper than that chaos. Any spiritual programs or practices that emphasize the self are also not worth your time if you really want to go deep. Now, this is my opinion. This is my opinion, and you may disagree, but I think, I think that a lot of what passes for spiritual enrichment today is too self-focused to be of much actual spiritual value to those who would live deeply of the soul, because the soul requires encounter with the other the great, you know, the big capital O, other, with God or the universe being the ultimate other before which I know myself to be less ultimate, less eternal, less perfect. Much of living deeply is getting beyond the ego. The soul and the personal ego don't have a lot to say to each other because the soul is eternal while the ego is not. Now here's a great quote. If the water is 60 feet underground, you won't reach it by digging six 10-foot wells. Let me repeat that. If the water is 60 feet underground, you're not going to reach it by digging six 10-foot holes, okay? This is so important for Unitarian Universalists to hear because we have so many sources of deep spiritual wisdom available to us. And it is important that we not just dabble in the shallows of a whole bunch of them and call that our religion. We are not a Chinese buffet of yummy bits from world religions. That's not a deep enough encounter or practice. Our deepest spiritual value is in the concept of covenant, which means being committed to the way that the soul operates in community. We encounter the other in human form, and our spiritual practice is to honor the soul in each and to look for it. We get glimpses of the holy through encounters with these souls, and so, Here's my second little story about the living waters, which takes place literally, is located literally at a well. It happens, it happened rather, when Jesus met a woman at a well in Samaria. He was on his way back to Galilee, and it was about noon, okay? This is a very hot climate, which is a terrible time to draw water from a well unless you want to use it to boil an egg in. But Jesus was thirsty, and so he asked this woman he met at the well to get him some water. I'm not going to get into the gender politics of this, okay? But if you've noticed that, yes. Hey, lady, that's your job. Let's get me some water. I need to tell you, Jews and Sumerians were not on good terms at all in this time. There were major ethnic and religious hostilities between them, in fact. So, also, it's unusual that both Jesus and this woman would have been alone at that well because, as you know, Jesus constantly had a crowd around him and he had a big posse of disciples. And also, women don't go to the well alone. They go together. It's a community thing. So this says something about this woman and how, uh, how she was probably somewhat estranged from her community. So the woman knows Jesus is a Jew and she's like, I, no, no, I'm not getting you any water. So Jesus preaches at her. This was an annoying habit of his. And he basically says, I know you don't know who I am, but I'm the Messiah. And I'm teaching and giving by my very being, by the depth of my soul, a living water, a living water that will relieve your thirst forever in a way that this water never can. And so the woman's pretty interested, and she says, this sounds good. It would really be nice to never have to draw water from the well again, meaning from this sort of less deep source that can dry up. She gets it, right? So Jesus says to her, and he's really setting her up here. He says, go get your husband 
And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus totally burns her. He says, I know you don't. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man that you're living with right now is not your husband. Now, in, in, among drag queens, we call this a, re a read. Okay, this is called getting red, like you just got red. Okay? So, this woman, who just got totally read by this stranger, could have gotten defensive. She could have, in fact, gotten furious. She could have pushed him in the well. You know, I don't need this judgment. I don't know who you are. I'm out of here. And she could have left, bailed. But she's interested in deep life. And she knows that deep life involves deep truth. And even deep truth that might be hard to hear. And you know, Jesus must have said what he said in a loving way. Like, I see you with your five husbands and the man you're living with in sin right now. I, I see you. But it must have been with love. And she is more interested in deep life than in protecting her own ego. And she is delighted. She tells Jesus, you must be a prophet. I see you. And she goes on to tell everyone about it, about her encounter. And I love this woman. She is not afraid of the truth. She is willing to see and be seen. And she's willing to go deep. And you know, who knows? She may have just been waiting for someone to meet her in that place of authenticity. Maybe the reason so many of us dabble in the shallows of spiritual life for so painfully long or for our entire lives is that we are afraid of being seen, of seeing others. We are afraid of stirring up our own depths, our fears, our mistakes, our weaknesses, our lies. People ask me, listen, church life, really? Because really, organized religion, I know it stands for all these great things, but it just brings out the pettiness in people. And I go, yeah, I know, I know. But it's because when we gather around the well, it's tempting. It's just so tempting to distract ourselves from the quiet song and strange power of the living waters. We're close enough to hear it. Some of us want to fall in and be submerged by it. Some of us want to sip it cautiously and then have coffee right afterward. Some of us want to run right off and dig another well, maybe 10 feet deep with a plastic spoon. Some of us want to study the well and write theories about the water. Whatever our instinct, we are drawn to the depths. We are close to the depths here in what we do, and we are always trying to gather more courage to encounter them and to go deeper. The deep is very deep, and the depths are not without their dangers. And so the well calls us not only beyond our ego and into community and to authenticity, but finally, it calls us into courageous witness and presence in our world. Deep calls to deep. It always will. And those who live deeply will always heed the call. Don't say, don't say there is no water. That fountain is there among its scalloped green and gray stones. It is still there and always there with its quiet song and strange power to spring in us up and out through the rock.